Hi, I'm Crane. This video has taken a little longer to put together than I anticipated. But there's an easy way for, for me to inform you if this happens in the future. Just go to twitter.com slash itscrane and follow me there and I'll tweet out the progress of the videos. All my social links are always in the description and it's always slash itscrane. With no apostrophe because it's a link and an H in crane. Just so you know that. Okay, last time we left our dear Nephilim, they had just defeated Diablo, the primeval. But let's start this video off by talking about Tyrael. After Tyrael decided to destroy the World Stone and reveal sanctuary to both heaven and hell, given both free reign, he dematerialized. It took 20 years for him to regain his physical form and was immediately confronted by Imperius. Imperius strongly disagreed with Tyrael's actions and was prepared to take him down. After a brief duel, Tyrael decided to leave his brothers and heaven behind to become mortal. He took Deckard Cain's role as the advisor to the heroes of the adventure and aided them in their mission to defeat Diablo, the prime evil. After Diablo's defeat and the Nephilim left, Tyrael stayed behind in the heavens as the aspect of wisdom, taking Malthale's place. Though he had a hard time adapting to his new life as mortal, food was not something he could easily acquire and the constant light of the heavens made it hard for him to sleep. He felt out of place among his angelic brethren. He went to the courts of justice, his former domain, and was faced with the visions of every angel who had died at the hands of Diablo. The fallen angels held Tyrael responsible for their deaths, and overcome with guilt, Tyrael left his old domain. He later witnessed the Light Song, a process that creates new angels, by having other angels tune their essences into the crystal arch in sync. This time, however, he could only watch and not partake. Tyrael finally realized how his former traveling companions, the Nephilim, Cain and Leah, all overcame fear and found hope. Inspired, he started to live up to his new title as the Aspect of Wisdom and slowly began to notice that something was wrong. As a mortal, he gazed upon the high heavens and noticed the subtle darkening of the realm. And in the center of this growing disharmony, he found it, the Black Soul Stone. The angels recovered it, but Imperius and Auriel couldn't agree on what to do with it. Tyrael began noticing the effect the Soulstone had on his brethren. Those around the Soulstone became bombarded with dark thoughts, and even though Tyrael warned them of the growing disharmony it was creating, they largely ignored him. Imperius called it mortal cowardice. Imperius refused to listen to Tyrael, since he blamed him for the Worldstone's destruction. And since Tyrael was now mortal, Imperius viewed him as an unworthy successor to Malthael as the Aspect of Wisdom. Imperius took his mistrust of humanity even further by calling up a revote for Sanctuary's right to exist. Imperius once again demanded that humanity and Sanctuary be eradicated while Auriel stood for Sanctuary's right to live on. Finally, Ethereal spoke. The issue at the heart of the matter was the Black Soulstone, and as it was forged by human magic, the scroll of fate could not guide him. The debate once again turned to the fate of the stone, and then Tyrael spoke. It had to be hidden in Sanctuary. Imperius and Auriel strongly disagreed with him, as he once again pointed to how the stone was corrupting them, while Imperius once again singled him out for his mortality. Eventually, Imperius drew his weapon, just as he did when Tyrael surrendered his wings. Tyrael refused to draw his sword and left. If the council would not respect his decision to become mortal, he wouldn't remain. Tyrael went to the Pools of Wisdom, Malthael's former domain, and consulted Chaladar, the Chalice of Wisdom. His fears were confirmed. If the Black Soulstone remained in the heavens, it would fall together with Sanctuary. It also showed how humanity were the only ones capable of watching over the Soulstone as they had the perspective required to perform such a task. However, Tyrael knew that the angels wouldn't let him take the Soul Stone, so he kept his conclusion a secret and began considering who he could entrust the Soul Stone to. The Herodrum instantly came to mind, though they ceased to exist with Cain's death. He delved into Deckard Cain's books and learned of the existence of the First Ones, a group of scholars who had laid the foundations for a new order. Thus, Tyrael resolved to refound the order and entrust it to guard the Black Soul Stone. Tyrael attended another light song, as a new angel was about to be born, but this time, something was wrong. 
He felt a dissonance in the arch, yet none of the angels seemed to notice. As his eyes and ears burned, he realized that the Black Soul Stone had corrupted the arch itself, and that Chalador had heightened his senses to the point where he could see it. Belzale, Imperius Lieutenant, stopped Tyrael on his way out and informed him that the Council would put him on trial for treason. Tyrael chose to leave, resolving to forge a team of gifted humans to seize the Black Soul Stone. He opened a portal and left the High Heavens, taking Chalodar with him. Tyrael consulted with Chalodar on a regular basis, but every time it left him more and more drained and yet hungry for more. He sought out trustworthy mortals whose talents lay in magic and other martial disciplines to strengthen the New Order. He recruited Jacob of Stalbrek, the wizard Shanar, the monk Mikulov, the barbarian Givnir, Zael the Necromancer, and Thomas and Cullen of the First Ones. In Condorus, Tyrael told the group of the history of Sanctuary from its creation to the Nephilim's triumph over Diablo at the Crystal Arch. He told them of his plans to hide the Black Soul Stone in the catacombs of Corvus, an area shrouded in mystery. However, they had no idea of its whereabouts. Zael suggested that they head for Bramwell, a village in Westmarch, to find Borad Nar, whom he had been led to believe could help them. On the journey there, tension grew between Tyrael and Jacob, for Jacob had wielded Eldrian after the destruction of Mount Ariette before Tyrael summoned the sword back to his side. They arrived in Westmarch, tired and hungry from their long journey, and met with Borad Nar, who informed the group of ill-goings in the town. Black-winged creatures, taking citizens in the night, made worse by the tension between Westmarch and the Templar Order. Tyrael wondered if Imperius had begun an assault on Sanctuary, but considered it unlikely. Tyrael told Borad Nar of the intent to find a Zakarun repository that he believed could aid them in finding Corvus. Borad Nar confirmed its existence and handed them one of the texts he had recovered from the area. He agreed to take them there. Despite this, Tyrael was still uneasy. Jacob had told him of a villager who had raved about a destroyer of worlds, and there was still no explanation for the phantom creatures. Nor was he confident that his group of Herodrim could work effectively as a team. Regardless, the group gained entry, and inside they found the bones of the missing people of Bramwell. Tyrael realized that it wasn't a repository, but something far older, even older than Zaka Room. They had found Corvus, though not an ideal place to hide the stone, time was running out. And so the Horodrim led by Tyrael snuck into heaven and successfully retrieved the soul stone. Though Tyrael was called to account for his actions, Imperius demanded that he stand trial, while Auriel and Ethereal had come to recognize the adverse effects of the Black Soul Stone, vouched for his reinstatement as the aspect of wisdom, and as an ambassador between the heavens and sanctuary. Auriel sorrowfully accepted that Tyrael had chosen a path that had ensured heaven would no longer be his home, but understood that sanctuary is where he wanted to be. Imperius was outraged, and Tyrael accepted that his brother would never be swayed from his views on sanctuary and humanity, and that the bond they once shared could never be mended. Imperius warned him that if he turned his back on him, they would forever be enemies. In response, Tyrael tossed Chaladar at his fellow Archangel and took his leave. With the Soul Stone stolen, but unable to be destroyed, Tyrael and the Herodrim took the stone into a series of catacombs underneath Westmarch. Twenty years earlier, Malthael, the former Archangel of Wisdom, disappeared after the destruction of the World Stone. Just prior to this, however, he had taken a greater interest in humanity, as well as the mystery of human existence and their struggle with life and death. When he left the High Heavens, many speculated that he haunted the halls of Pandemonium. In truth, Malthael had seen everything that would come to pass. He had seen the actions of Zoltan Kool, a human who had embraced evil. He had beheld the power of the Nephilim. He had seen that hero defeat the prime evil, an act that in all his years of war in the eternal conflict he had never been able to match. Faced with such power and beholding humanity as an abomination, Malthael resolved to become the embodiment of death. He discovered a whirling vortex of human souls within the heart of the Pandemonium Fortress, where the Wallstone once rested. He transformed the vortex into a soul prison, and harnessed the spirit's energy to become the aspect of death. With the Lords of Hell defeated, he reasoned that humanity was the most powerful demonic force left. 
He established the Pandemonium Fortress as his base of operations and recruited Imperius Lieutenant Belzale as well as Urzale, who shared his views on humanity. The angelic maidens that Urzale had brought with him also pledged themselves to Malthale's cause. Malthale also manipulated the Templar Order sect in Westmarch to act as a distraction in Sanctuary so that his wider efforts could not be detected. After Diablo's assault on Heaven, Malthale, going by the name of the Guardian, was kept informed of events by Balzale. He was told of how the Black Soulstone was corrupting the Angiris Council, just as planned. The Council was discussing the fate of Sanctuary, and it was Malthale's goal that the stone given enough time to corrupt the Council so that they would unleash the Heavenly Host upon the mortal world, eradicating humanity. However, Tyriel's act of reforming the Herodrim with the intent of stealing the Soul Stone threw his plans into jeopardy. That and the Templar Order sect he'd influenced in Westmarch was scattered by the Knights of Westmarch and its members killed or imprisoned. The stone was taking too long to sway the Council against humanity, so Malthale altered his plans. Malthale informed Balzale to let Tyriel and the Herodrim take the stone. Once it was out of heaven, he would take the stone for himself and enact a new plan that would still lead to humanity's end. The plan worked and the Herodrim retrieved the stone. In Sanctuary, Malthale possessed one of the captive Templar and killed the others that had been imprisoned with the man. Malthale then used his powers to extinguish the torches in the cells and reap the souls of the other prisoners. He then moved down into the catacombs that would take him to Corvus and to the Black Soul Stone. Diablo was defeated. For a time it seemed we would know peace. But it was not to be. For Diablo's essence lingers in the Black Soul Stone. I cannot destroy the stone. Nor allow its evil to remain within the heavens. And so it must be hidden. Even from the angels. I pray that it will be enough. Well, Horadrum, your service here is finished, and you should all... Stop you. No. 
Nar fled the tomb of Rakis and found the Nephilim, and together they fought their way into a survivor's enclave where Tyriel awaited them. When they met with Tyriel, he explained that with the defeat of Diablo as the primeval, Malthael had deemed the time right to end the eternal conflict, which meant the eradication of humanity as per its demonic heritage. This was demonstrated when Reapers entered a nearby Sakarum Cathedral, killing most of the townspeople hiding inside. Tyriel, Lorath, the Nephilim, and Westmarch soldiers ran inside the cathedral and defeated the death maiden Casadia. The Nephilim wanted to find Malthale, but Tyriel only knew that he was not in Westmarch and could be anywhere in creation. However, he realized that when Malthale took the stone, a sliver of the artifact broke off. Having retrieved it, Tyriel reasoned that if he studied the sliver, he might be able to locate Malthale. The Nephilim had a moment to talk to their fellow adventurers that helped them on their journey. Adrig, the blacksmith, finally found a new apprentice. Covetous Shen, the jeweler, finally hinted that there might be more to him than meets the eye. Apparently, he was once married to Miriam, the mystic. He is also compared to the trickster god Zai multiple times, and that the connection might go deeper than mere comparison. He told the Nephilim of Zai, who once tricked the demon god Durgist by getting the attention of Durgist's wife, Lyria. She eventually fell for Zai, and this made Durgis furious. He slew everyone Zai held dear, including his own wife, Lyria. Zai eventually imprisoned Durgis inside a priceless jewel, but Zai himself remained all alone. Covetous went together with the Nephilim in search of the jewel, which was buried in the unearthed ruins close to the city. When they finally reached the end of the ruins, they discovered, much to Shen's horror, that the jewel had been shattered and the demon god had been freed. The Nephilim defeated Vecris, the demon guarding Lyria's spirit, when suddenly Shen changed his voice and manner of speaking beyond recognition. Lyria's liberated soul asked Shen if he was Zai, as did Vecris before the battle, to which he replied he was just a simple jeweler and that Zai was long gone, but sadly said that he was happy to see Lyria's face one final time. Cormac found out the horrific truth behind the Templar Order and how they tortured their new recruits, effectively brainwashing them. Though when he returned, he found himself being welcomed back as a hero. He then found out that the torture was performed with the consent of the Grand Maester. Furious, Cormac ordered the initiates to be unshackled and then went on to confront the Grand Maester. The Grand Maester, truly proud of Cormac, replied that such measures were necessary and offered Cormac to be his second in command and eventually become the Grand Maester himself. Cormac refused and the Templars were ordered to kill him. Cormac killed the Grand Maester and decided to leave the order. Linden overheard a Westmarch dungeon guard saying that prisoners from Kingsport had been transferred to Westmarch. This meant that Linden could finally free his brother, Edlin. Together with the Nephilim, they went to the dungeons. Inside, they were ambushed by the Thieves' Guild, dressed up as Westmarch guards, and in one of the cells, they found Edlin's corpse. Linden noticed the dagger that had been used to kill his brother, and it looked very familiar to him. Overcome with grief, Linden kept to himself, but when the Nephilim brought the dagger to Adrig, he found a note hidden inside the handle. It was addressed to Linden. If you want to seek revenge, I will be waiting for you. It was signed, Rhea, Edlin's wife. Irena started to hear voices of her long lost sisters, and after finding the source, in a separate realm of existence, they found her sisters one by one. All dead. All but one. She met her sister Lysa, where she learned the truth. The prophet that had trained them chose Irena to be the one to fight the great evils. With all the other sisters given the choice of leaving the sisterhood, or sacrificing their lives to ensure Irena survived until the end of days. All of her sisters agreed, save Liza. She was furious that she was not the one chosen. She bargained with demons and attempted to kill her sisters in their sleep. The sisters who woke up amidst the demonic horde sacrificed their lives to protect Irena, still in slumber, just as the prophets predicted. Many years later, Lysa used the captured souls of her slain sisters to lure Irena to her trap in the lair of the Prophet. 
After fighting Liza to her death, Irena decided to continue the Prophet's work by assembling a new sisterhood. And rather than sleeping for centuries, the new order would pass knowledge down from generation to generation for as long as it took to fulfill their purpose. The Nephilim fought and defeated Malthael's forces in Westmarch, as well as Urzael. During the fighting, they found a mystic named Miriam. She told the Nephilim of a witch hiding in the Blood Marsh, and that she was the only one who knew where Malthael was hiding. The Nephilim realized that the mystic was talking about Adria, the woman that had sacrificed her own daughter to bring Diablo back. The Nephilim battled creatures that had been corrupted by Adria's newfound blood magic. The trail led them to the ruins of Corvus, the ancient Nephilim city. The Nephilim finally cornered Adria in the Great Hall, just in time to learn that the Angel of Death resided in Pandemonium. Adria then threw herself into a pit of blood and re-emerged as a massive blood demon and attacked the Nephilim. During the battle, she noted that Diablo sent her a vision of his return, with none other than the Nephilim releasing him. The Nephilim killed Adria, exacting justice for her betrayal and avenging her daughter. They left Corvus and met with Tyrael back in the survivor's enclave. Tyrael had just finished deciphering the Soulstone Sliver. He told the Nephilim of Malthael's horrible actions. He was fundamentally altering the Black Soulstone to consume and contain all demonic essence in Sanctuary. This meant that humanity faced annihilation as their demonic heritage would be torn from their souls by the stone and their bodies be ripped apart. Malthael, in the heart of the Pandemonium Fortress, was continually feeding off the increasing souls of the dead and grew more powerful with each passing moment. Tyrael took the Nephilim to the Pandemonium Gate in Heaven, only to find it under attack by Malthael's Reapers. When the Reapers had been defeated, Imperius appeared. He reluctantly agreed that Malthael had to be stopped, despite the fact that he did not care whether Malthael wanted to destroy humanity. He had attacked the heavens, and through this action declared war on his former allies. Imperius led the Nephilim through the battlefields of eternity, the giant wasteland that had been the arena of the constant war between heaven and hell, and finally reached the gates of Pandemonium. Tyrael reunited with the Nephilim outside the fortress. He once again told them of Malthael's plan and watched as the Nephilim entered the fortress. Inside, the Nephilim were met with spirits that reminded them of the past. The wizard, for example, met the spirit of her old master, the sorceress known as Isendra, one of the adventurers that had defeated Diablo 20 years prior. All of the Nephilim met different spirits, but all of them delivered the same message. Malthael had to be defeated, but couldn't be hurt by mortals. They had to become one with death. And once the Nephilim freed all of the trapped spirits, they gained death's power. The Nephilim traveled into the heart of the Pandemonium Fortress to confront Malthael. He proved to be an incredibly powerful adversary, displaying masterful prowess with his weapons as well as bombarding the Nephilim with waves of undeath. To bring the battle to an end, Malthael summoned the Black Soulstone into the fortress and shattered it, consuming the essence of Diablo. While this granted Malthael a massive boost in power, he was still ultimately defeated by the Nephilim. Malthael's defeat was shown to be a painful, agonizing one, coupled by a blinding explosion of energy that destroyed the roof of the fortress. As he fell to the floor below, the souls of all he had consumed erupted from his body as it slowly disintegrated. This included Diablo himself, who, thanks to Malthael's actions, was now free. Nephilim had done the impossible. By conquering death, he had redeemed the angels and saved all mankind. In that moment, with victory at hand, I saw the Nephilim in a new light. He is a hero who can defeat the champions of heaven and hell, and a crusader who protects the innocent. But within him beats a mortal heart that will one day be tempted to corruption. On that day, will he have the strength to resist 
or will he be our doom? And that's Diablo 3. Overall, I feel like this expansion cleaned up a lot of the mess which the original left behind. But Kane is still dead, and Tyrael is still mortal. I could repeat this a million times if that's what it takes. Also, wouldn't it make sense if with Malthale's defeat, all of the seven great evils be released and not just the prime evil? Because according to Blizzard, it was only Diablo as the prime evil that was released. To me, that comes off as really weird, because Diablo is not even the most interesting of the seven evils. Sure, his name is on the box, but I feel that both Bale and Mephisto outshine him in every way possible. And because of this, I hope that the next expansion has us hunting down Diablo, trying to split the prime evil back into sever seven different bodies. And also, this, this druid concept needs to become a reality. It looks really cool and I want it. Well, I've been Crane and this was Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls. Next time, we'll start talking StarCraft lore. And maybe someday, even Warcraft. More Diablo lore will be thrown in there for good measure, of course, talking about specific characters and events. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, you, you know how YouTube works, and I'll see you next time.